What up, y'all? This is your Don Israel coming to you live from Lit, asking y'all to subscribe to the channel. So make sure y'all subscribed, make sure y'all liking the videos, make sure y'all commenting, and make sure you turn on your notifications that let you know when new videos are dropping. We're dropping them daily, and you want to be on it, because we on it, all right? So keep it lit, keep it locked, subscribe, we out. Mark Duce is a dream. What's going on, y'all? It's your Don Israel. A.K.A. Liddy Fontaine, Pretty Liddy's what they call me. We back again with another episode of Lit, the premier platform for all things literary, swag, and everything else. Today's guest, we got my man, the super dope novelist, Victor Laval, who's in here today. We want to give him a round of applause for coming. Thank you, Bart Vic. We got some post-production. We claps are going to come uh, in. Okay, okay. It's going to sound way more boisterous than the way it sounds right now. <laughs> but we want to thank you for coming in. Um, Vic, you got to stand up for us because we always have people stand against the uh, the step and repeat. We are going to get better at me giving Danny the phone to capture the fits, but for now, well, we got the we got the Ona Super Tigers. Yes, right. The Nikes, the the first Nike. What before Nike was Nike, they was Ona Super. They used to fuck with them. Yes. Then what we got with the pants? Uh, Bonobos. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and, then, and then just a gap shirt. Okay, we keep it. We keep it. That's we keep it. it simple. All Let me see the uh, shoes. Let me see the shoes. You gotta keep the boom. Just do do like a hip hop thing. You gotta do a hip. You gotta put your foot on the table. Do like an NWA. Boom. There you go. That's how we do it. We rocking like that. And there's the socks. With the socks. Come on, what's the matter? Socks of those, baby. <laughs> well, frankly, these are socks from a Vermont museum. There you but go. But they uh, from my kids. <laughs> Fish hook socks. That, there you go. There we go. We <laughs> Moby Dick in it today. I, I love it. I love it. So. Vic, thank you for coming out. Yeah, man. it's good to be Appreciate here. Appreciate you. So, everybody who, everybody in the know, if you don't know, now you're about to know. Vic has a new novel uh, in stores today. Uh, it's called The Changeling. It dropped June 13th. Some, uh, yeah, right, right, right on there. Published by Pink. Spiegel and Growl. Spiegel and Growl. Right. Um, book follow it's a it's a was magical realism what would you call it i think it? that a fairy tale okay i would say like a very very dark fairy tale yeah so tell us uh about sort of the origins of the book well basically the plot of the book cuz mm. i interviewed you for poets and writers um and i know it's a book about the changeling fairy tale right. myth right. about the ways in which uh trolls get switched out a troll switches the baby out with a troll baby, yeah, but the parent doesn't know, right? And you had switched the relationship. Is usually in the fairy tale. It's usually a, a a woman who noticed. It's usually a woman who would happen to, but you switched it and you made it. You made the man a protagonist yes. in the fairy tale. So talk about the background of the book and just. Well, then, so the yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I paused. <laughs> that was a long pause. I wasn't sure where we were going. Well, but, uh, but the um, the. The basic idea is there's two main characters, Apollo and Emma. Mm -hmm. uh, Apollo is a used book dealer, and Emma is a librarian. They meet in their 30s. Uh, Apollo has to pursue her for a while, but eventually they fall in love. They get married. They have a kid, mm -hmm. uh, which for fairy tales is supposed to be when you say, and they lived happily ever after. Right. Uh, but the point of this book is to say that happily ever after is a scam, right? And that life is hard, and fairy tales are hard if you keep following them. Right. So in this case, they marry, they have this kid, and then if you ever had a kid, you know, a month into having a kid, three months into having a kid, you're tired, you're angry at each other, you're angry at this baby, uh, and all the fairy tale stuff is out the window because you're just trying to survive. Yeah. Uh, and then about six months into the, their life together, the wife Emma starts saying, "This is not a baby. Yeah. This is not a baby." And Apollo who is so invested in being a good, the kind of good father that he never had, mm -hmm. is basically like, you're crazy. Yeah. You're having postpartum depression. You should just take some drugs, shut up, and let me raise this kid. Yeah. And that's the beginning of the problems between the two of them. Yeah. So what's, how did this book start? Like, um, in terms of, from a conceptual standpoint, what made you want to approach magic realism? Because I know a lot of your books, um, mm -hmm. I read Slap Boxing with Jesus, um, and... That book was also like another book that like really brought like the uh, the otherworldly into the world. Well, in this case, in particular, uh, I would say like the way it actually began is so we, my wife and I, do have two kids. Yeah. Our son uh, was really maybe a day old. Mm -hmm. uh, we were at home, uh, and I had him 
swaddled up in a blanket. My wife was asleep. I had him swaddled up in a blanket, and he was tightly in the blanket, except one arm was sticking out like this, and he looked like Popeye. And I thought he looked amazing. And so I immediately started taking pictures, and then a, like two seconds after I took the pictures, I posted them on Facebook, right. like right away. I didn't even think about it. Mm. And uh, only 10 minutes later did I start to say, why did I do that, you know? Mm. Uh, most of the people who I know on Facebook, I have never met in real life. Yeah. And if it was the real world, if any one of those people tried to touch my son, I would have slapped, slapped them, <laughs> yeah. you know? So why would I be so quick to give them this yeah. private thing? This, and it started turning my gears like, well, what if one of the people who I'm friends with is somebody who's not gonna do something good with that picture? Mm -hmm. And in fact, has maybe evil intentions right. about children. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And then I started thinking about it as we started raising our kid. If you're the kind of parent like me, you know, overindulgent, kind of vain, uh, but also loving and proud yeah. parent, I'm posting what parks we go to. I'm posting what school he goes to. I'm posting where we go all the time. I'm posting when sometimes when me and my wife go out on a date night and they're home alone with a teenager who's the babysitter. Uh -huh. And essentially, I would be given a kidnapper. Or a monster. A everything they need to know yeah. to get my kid. And I the worst part is I volunteered all that. Yeah. And I thought this is like the heart of something that would is horrifying to me and would be horrifying to a lot of people. Right, right, right. I didn't even think about till you just said it. That like that's also a basis of the book is horror. Yes. And yes. even though those those elements are there, until you really put that in context, I didn't really think about it as horror. I just thought about it and like that you know, like that sort of fantasy. Right. And, but you know, for me, what the you know what was so real about the book is that it, like to what you said, it, it touched these very um, human and not 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 I don't, universal. I think is 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 over overstated. Yeah. But I really I think it touched to the core of I think what we tried to like what the dangers of social media and the web is, and it's like this whole idea of like. What are we really giving up when we give up when we sat what are we really giving up when we put ourselves out there into the world that we don't really think is a real world right because it's right. like you said like in the real world somebody try to touch a kid you will slap them but then it's this digital world that kind of works as a sort of like simulacrum of the real world that's right that allows us to go well this isn't as you know insidious as someone touching my baby that's right there's the i, I would say like there's the uh what is it like the uh the i'm trying to think of the word but like I guess you can delude yourself into thinking that you have a certain type of power. That's right. Into on, in on on digital landscape. So from what I understood when we had the first conversation, in the, the in the immediate thing, the book opens up with Emma knowing the baby, or Emma suspecting. Yes, suspect. Yes, just suspect. suspecting the baby wasn't the baby. It was already switched out with the troll, mm -hmm. and she just bashes Apollo's head. Yeah. And your editors are like, nah, that's not, that's not, that's not, son. That's not, you can't just start a book like that. It was, yeah, it was chapter one. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, that yeah. Was, uh, it was too much, uh, they convinced me it was too much too quickly. Yeah. Uh, and in a way, maybe I think all the stuff about, is it magic realism? Is it fantasy? Is it whatever? I think a lot of those things you wouldn't even have thought because the idea of first chapter, somebody gets bashed in the head and, and uh, almost killed and then a child is put in danger you immediately think of like bad horror, right? right? Where you got to kill somebody in the first five minutes. Yeah. Uh, and it would fit in this case because the first person seeming to get killed is a black man. So that fits too with horror, right? And the old <laughs> yeah, stereotypes yeah. of everything there. Yeah. Um, and that in a way it would throw you off, throw a they were basically like, it'll throw off a reader for the rest of the book. Yeah. Into thinking this is like a cheap scare yeah. kind of book. And I know you want it, you want it to hurt yeah. when this happens. You want people to care about these people when it happens. Right. So we need to get to know them. Absolutely. And it was great advice, and it was nice to sort of then step back and go so far back that I, you basically had to get to know their, his parents, mm -hmm. Apollo and Emma's parents, yeah. before you got to know how we come to that moment of extreme horror. Yeah. And I think what it also did, the, uh, what, what it, it allowed people to see that, you know, real life situations are not as cut and dry as we sort of trying to make them to be. And I think that that book, by like, Putting that history in there, it resists this uh, very easy exercise of turning someone into the good and the bad person. For sure. Like well, it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that I was interested in at the same time was uh, all the, you know, I mean, it goes back a long way, but in, when I was a kid, like in the 80s, all these moms who killed their kids, 
right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, part of whenever they would talk to when they if they were on trial or whatever, you had one or two, a couple who were like, oh, "A black man killed my kids," and public. so that's a separate yeah. group, right? Yeah. But then there was another group who would say, "I was trying to protect them." Like mm -hmm. again and again, and and even though they clearly had gone insane and were thinking wrong, it wasn't that they were like, "I hate my kids and I want them to die." Mm -hmm. It was always from love, yeah, some weird twisted love that they made that choice. And I was interested in what if I didn't, like in the case of the wife Emma, if from the outside any news report would say this was the story of a monstrous woman, yeah. But then if you were inside the story, you would say. It's not that simple. Right. She made choices because she believed something. Right. And then maybe it turned out that she was actually the one that was right. Yeah. But why was I so quick to judge right. her and assume she was in the wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, and trying to get at all the prejudices we have against certain kind of mothers and things like that. And mothers in general. And right? mothers in general. Because There's I think that that's like the threshold for which a mother can be a bad mother so so easy to walk through. I don't even think, I think it starts, it push, you start at like, you are bad, <laughs> the kid is born bad mom is like the given because there's something you're not doing that someone somewhere your own mother as i have seen your mother-in-law as i have seen yeah passing women on the street someone somewhere or men on the street will tell you all the ways you are doing something wrong as yeah. the mom right. whereas the funny thing i saw was for me as the father if I, as long as i was holding that baby out on the street and not essentially bashing its head on the ground as i walked Everything was, you are an amazing dad. Look yeah. at you. You're holding that kid? Yeah. What a what an angel you are. Right. I mean, the amount of credit that I got for what the, was the what was the When was the first moment? Because you had, your oldest son is how old? He's six. Yeah. Six so, five. when was the first moment for you that that clicked? Like, in a real life situation, when did that go like, oh shit, like, this is not fair? Well, I knew, so, um, it ended up in the book, but I remember my uh, wife, the, uh, our son is a week old or something like mm -hmm. that. Uh, and she's working on getting him to latch for uh, breastfeeding. Yeah. Right? And I'm not going to say who it was exactly in the family, but our extended family comes to the house and one of the women of the family who has raised kids, mm -hmm. uh, so an older generation, comes over and says, let me see how you're doing it. Yeah. You know? Uh, and then my wife's showing her and then she goes, oh, she stops. She goes, oh, it's too bad your breasts are the wrong shape. Like, what and we're just all like, oh, oh. like, how, what do you even do to that? Because number one, this was a woman who has raised many kids, a woman who we respected and loved. So yeah. there's a way that we know she's not saying this out of cruelty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is like, how do you, you can't fix that, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And essentially, really what the woman was actually saying is, this doesn't look like what I'm used to, mm -hmm. so I don't know what to do. Right. But it is hard for any human being to ever say, I don't know how to give you an answer. So instead they just say, oh, you just, you're wrong. You were born wrong. That's it. And so we shuttled that lady out of the room, right? <laughs> and then she went back to practicing. And within like a couple weeks, our son was latching and he was breastfeeding and all was fine because there's no such thing as a bad, a wrong shape breast for breastfeeding yeah, yeah, per yeah. necessarily. Um, so that was her, that was what I saw. I got to, I was there. So I saw that happen. Mm -hmm. And then really honestly, like I remember the first time uh, we felt comfortable taking him out for a walk and I had him just on my shoulder and I was just walking around the block and it was on one level it was just very sweet people just saying God bless you God bless you because of the newborn you know mm -hmm. but then also people saying God bless you for being in his life God bless you for being there and all this and just thinking like uh, you know that old joke like how low is the bar for fathers mm -hmm. that the fact that and I know how low it is because my dad was not a great dad so uh but the bar is so low that the fact that I was walking with him mm -hmm. made people basically like, I, if they had rose petals, they would have yeah. thrown rose petals. But then it's also, you know, and this is another, like, I don't want to say a truth, but a contingent truth mm -hmm. of like black fathers. Yes. Of like how often, especially like you're, you live in Washington Heights, yeah. how rare that image is for, yes. for some people. Well, that's the funny thing is I felt like uh, I know how rare that image is, but I don't know how rare that truth is right no that's why i said a that's, contingent truth that's right because i think right. it's contingent upon where you live and what you have access to that's right and so if like i'm from best i grew yeah. up there like if i am looking at that image that's an image that stands out of my mind because it's like you know i've always seen mothers with their kids yeah so i think it's something that happens that's very pernicious where it starts off as something 
that you think like because I see mothers with their with with their kids all the time, I don't notice mothers at all. I kind of notice bad mothers. Right. I notice right. mothers sans their kids. Like, oh, yeah. where's her kids? Yeah, that's right. And so when you see a father, you think you're doing your job by like congratulating that which you haven't seen. It's like right. it's like its own fantasy that's in right. a sense. That's right. Like recognizing a unicorn. Like, oh shit, there's a father <laughs> holding his son. Like that's that's right. a new shit. I gotta I gotta talk to that man. Like, yes. what do you do? Like, yes. where, where do you work? You know and. <laughs> right. But meanwhile, these mothers have been doing this for a long time, and you kind of like like acknowledge that as a natural thing. Which That's is, right. It's supposed you, to be yeah, that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other one is also supposed to be that way, mm-hmm. but it it isn't enough that it starts to seem like magic mm-hmm. when it is that way. But I mean, but for me, the other thing that was uh, that was always in my mind, especially when the conversation would be specifically like, as a black father, I'm so happy to see you, whatever like that. Uh, there was all. I mean, I was. There were times like in the beginning, I finally gave up arguing, and I said, "Oh, you know, the father who abandoned me was white." I just want to point out, lots yeah. of white fathers abandon yeah. their children, uh, and he didn't look back. Yeah. So, and then at a certain point, uh, my wife was just like, "You know, you can't tell everyone. You can't tell everyone who compliments you on being a good black father in particular, because I knew what was underneath that mm-hmm. was you all are never good fathers." Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I always want to say like, "Well." This white dude was not a good father. Right. I'll show you a picture. I'm sure I can find one. You know, uh, just to give credit, yeah. to spread credit around. But yeah. then at a certain point, I realize you can't, uh, you can't live your life trying to disprove a thing like yeah. that. You just have to try to Word. do that thing. Well, uh, just for because we do a podcast too um, for the people watching and then for people listening. When I first met Vic, I thought he was Puerto Rican I know, and or I Dominican, know. especially yeah. when he saved from Washington Heights. I, yeah. I didn't know that many black people that lived there. And so when you when I found out he was just the product of a mixed white and black, your mother's from Uganda. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And your father's from like Syracuse, New York. Yeah. That's white right. guy from Syracuse. I was like, okay. Yeah. I was not expecting that. <laughs> so I was like. No. I don't I, think that anyone ever guesses that combination. Yeah. It was just like, oh, you're just white and black. It was yeah. just like, nah, he's, he's, he's something Puerto Rican or, yeah. and or Dominican. Well, and also my name is Victor Laval. It's got, and so in Washington Heights, my name is Victor Lavalle. There's oh. no question. Like that's how it's pronounced. <laughs> yeah. You know. Uh, and so up there, but you got like a, you also got like a, you know, like a, like a Puerto Rican Dominican man swag. Like your swag but, is very. But maybe it's because I've been living in my yeah, for yeah, seven yeah, years. Yeah, I don't know. I just think, uh, it, yeah. I mean, when I had dreads, no one thought that. You had dreads? Yeah. In college. Get the fuck out of here. Like college grad school. I gotta see a picture. I've gotta find a picture. They were long, <laughs> too long and thick, and this never came up. I am. What I mean, made you get them? And what made you cut them? Well, I mean, uh, so I got them. We could be Trent brothers. It, could be <laughs> it was me, like you know, a, I was I started growing him like sophomore sophomore year of college maybe something okay. like that and uh, and um, it was a mix. Now with distance, I I see it was a mix. It was one, it was a de- it was a degree of pride. I was coming into a degree of like political awareness. And so so black this is early nineties. Yes, early nineties, okay. like ninety one. Oh yeah, this was definitely uh, the swing of things. So that was like a big part of it, and so I took also special pride in like um, they were like big naughty dreads you okay. know what i mean like uh to the point where, like the whole idea was like grow them for a while and then just sort of tear them a little so that they would because if it was too much i didn't i couldn't go for the full like burning spear giant single oh, you knot. wanted to get like a I wanted, sword yeah like something, or, yeah even like i mean even like i guess like even marley or something like that okay where they were a little thicker yeah you know a little rougher kind of look yeah um and so i grew those and i had them up until night so started in 91 and i had them till 98 99 okay like right around there okay um and i grew them out of this sense of pride but at, and like uh and awakening consciousness and all this but there was also a way that i was like at the time i was like uh, another i was maybe a hundred pounds heavier 120 pounds heavier and um in a bad place like emotionally fit mentally yeah, all this yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. and so there was a way like i i would grow the dreads out of pride but then i would wear them like a curtain in front of my face. I look like it from uh, Adam's family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, which uh, it was like, so it was a mixed sort of message. Like, look at me, I'm proud, but then I'm hiding my face, essentially. Yeah. Uh, and so... So this is a mix of like pride and shame. Yes, exactly. Yes. And yeah. so the pride was about black pride, but then the shame was about personal shame. Ah. Uh, you know, uh, and trying to that. put these two together. Yeah. Uh, and so I think when I got to be around 98, 99... Uh, two things happened. Like number one, I started feeling like um, 
I don't want to. I don't want to hide behind these anymore. I started feeling more confident. Yeah. And all this stuff, and I was. Uh, I had sold a book, and I felt maybe a, mm. a certain degree of like. Um, I want to show people my face. Yeah, you know, yeah, right? yeah. I want you to know? be out. There. And so for a while, I was wearing it more like I was actually pulling it back and like yeah. showing my face and all this. And then I remember I saw this movie called Once Were Warriors. You ever see that one? No. It's a. It's about the. It takes place in New Zealand. It's about okay. Maori folks down okay. there. Okay. Uh, and it's a great movie, basically about coming to terms with being the local population but having been taught to be ashamed of who you are mm. and it's this one family the father is like a pretty vicious alcoholic yeah um it's a maori family and then the the sons and daughter i believe uh like one of the sons goes like full like he starts getting the tattoos yeah, and yeah, he's yeah. doing everything and then there's this great moment toward the end where um They've started, everyone has started sort of reconciling the personal and the political and all stuff. Yeah. And then that brother, who now has like face tattoos and everything of like the traditional stuff, says to the younger brother, do you want to, if you want to come, I can give you the, I can make you one of these. Yeah. And then the brother says, has like a nice smile, he says, I wear mine on the inside. Ooh. And I love that line. And it was this moment where I realized, oh, I don't have to, I had moved to a point where I said, I don't have to show everyone that I'm proud of this anymore you can show them I can just show it however I want to show so you it got, so you still in your heart you got your dress exactly and so okay. I cut them all off and I was on a beach alright so everybody who wants to know what Victor Laval's heart looks like it's look like it's, it's dreaded it's got dreads it's got yes, dreads, that's it's, right. got dreads. That's right. it's a perfect line <laughs> um, so let's take take us back when does um, literature enter your life in uh, a very real way like who was your who was your sort of your 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 Lewis and Clark your more, more so your Sacagawea. Who was your guy? <laughs> Who was the guy? Well, the the truth is the way I got into reading was, uh, I mean, I was always like a a bookish kid, so I liked comic books from a very young yeah, age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go to the corner store that, and when they used to have the rack with the comics on them. And you grew uh, up? You I grew where? up in Flushing, Queens. Okay. Um, and so you, I would go in the store. The store was called Gina Rose. That was the one where it was these two sisters, Gina and Rose. Yeah. And they ran the place and they would let the kids come. They would let uh, uh, the boys come in. And just take comics off the rack and read. They didn't that's, like chase you out or anything. That's dope. And then every once in a while, my mother would give me thirty-five cents or whatever it was at the time, long ago. And uh, and uh, and I would buy a comic and take it home. Nineteen twenties. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then at a certain point, I think the comic books stopped being enough. And I would and I sort of noticed next to the comic book rack was the mass market paperback yeah. books. You know. And uh, like the Danielle still, yeah, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, and my mom was not. I was not a reading, a big reading household. So, but my mom did want to support me. She liked me reading, mm -hmm. but it was like even if she wasn't a big reader, and so she would say, "You can." I would say, "I want to buy a book now," and she said, "Well, you can pick something off the rack." But so, romance novels always had like two sweaty people holding each other. Yeah. So she's not going to buy the me Fabio. That. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, Spy movies, spy books or whatever had guns on the cover. She wasn't going to buy me that. Okay. But horror books usually just had like a house with like <laughs> an orange glow behind yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in a way, like I became a horror fan mostly because it was the one kind of paperback I could get her to buy. Oh. Because okay. she wouldn't read what they were about. Yeah. She just would say, okay, that cover looks okay. Yeah, we can make it. We can, yeah, we can do that. Mm -hmm. And so... That's how I got introduced to Stephen King. I thought it was a. I was about to say, damn, is there a, is there a, is there a, a, a house on this cover? Is there a house? Uh, was, yeah, but it's not. It's a baby. <laughs> it's in a, a baby in a, in a yes. forest. Yeah. Um, but uh, so Stephen King, Peter Straub, Clive Barker. Uh, when I got a little older, because his covers were a little more bloody, I had to wait till I could buy that myself. Shirley Jackson. These were all the all the horror writers. Yeah. H.P. Lovecraft. All these people who uh, you could get somewhere in the bookstore. Right. I mean, in the corner store mm. uh, especially Stephen King I think he yeah. was like the one you could reliably get and so he was the one I just that's how I became a reader yeah. uh, and it was uh, I would say a little bit of a chaotic house that I grew up in uh, and chaotic in what sense um it's a lot of uh, mental illness in the family okay so uh, so I, you couldn't always rely on each day coming into the house, you weren't sure what kind of house it was. A house of screaming and yelling and fighting mm -hmm. or a house of quiet and everything's nice. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, being able to have a big book that I could sit in the corner with, mm -hmm. if I was sitting in a corner reading a book, I would be left alone no matter what kind of house it was. Okay. And so it was a nice way to stay safe. All right. You know. 
And uh, so it, there that's was a very that, ironic. You use horror to stay safe. To stay safe. Out, yeah. That's that's, that's a. Conundrum but you know, for your ass. But the other thing that, the other reason I think I loved horror was because if you think about like a lot of horror is about, think about like The Shining. Mm-hmm. Some Your dad is such a heavy drinker that he decides he's going to kill you. And I'll tell you, like sometimes the level of chaos in the house, that actually felt realistic. Uh, right? And okay. so there was a way too that it felt like kids in danger, you can't always trust the people in your home or there's a monster in the home and it's going to get you. Mm. That feels like life. Yeah. And so there's a way that it felt like, yes, this, you know, and like Huckleberry Finn, blah, blah, blah. I know those are classics, but in a way, I, said, I don't know anything about riding down a river. I don't know about anything like that, yeah. but I do understand this. Yeah. And that, and that was it. That, that makes sense. I know you brought some, I see you got Shirley Jackson. Is that the first yes. person who brought you? Read some of that. I read the first, I yeah. just brought the first paragraph. Yeah, yeah read that. Read of that. Uh, her most famous book, The Haunting of Hill House. Okay. And it says, uh, no live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. Even larks and katydids are supposed by some to dream. Hill House, not sane, stood by itself against its hills, holding darkness within. It had stood for eighty years and might stand for eighty more. Within, walls continued upright, bricks met neatly, floors were firm, and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wood and stone of Hill House, and whatever walked there walked alone. Bam. And I just love that. For, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's just the scene. That's I mean, right. we got a little bit of horror for <laughs> <in> the damn flies. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, but, um, so what was it for you? Let me ask you. If you could bring language to what the horror genre is, mm-hmm. how would you describe, how do you know you're reading horror? Well, I'll tell you, even in that paragraph, just right. even to go over this one part of this, the book again, I remember when I read it the first time, it mm-hmm. just blew my head back or something like that. It was Hill House, not sane, stood by itself against its hills. And just in that like little aside, this idea that she immediately tells you, this is a house that has gone insane. And then you figure, as you read the book, and there's four people who are going to be brought to it. Mm-hmm. And... For me, like that is such a crazy concept yeah. that 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 quickly. <laughs> <laughs> there was this, there, there was some music playing somewhere. I don't know that if that was, was a nice, part of the horror. That's right. That was like good. the horror element to it. And too. that was good horror <laughs> horror violin. And it's back. And it's back. Yeah, we we'll we'll, we'll talk over it. Yeah. But um, but uh, just that idea of like so quickly you could say and with such confidence mm-hmm. you don't have to explain blah 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 Hill House not sane, Mm -hmm. stood by itself against its hills. And it's setting up for you immediately like, well, if it's there by itself, Mm -hmm. it's been driven insane by isolation. Right. And then if the book is about four people are being brought here, it's like a, like what would you do if you, you know, it's like you're just thinking like someone's about to be locked into a room with someone or something that has gone insane. Yeah. But it's not a person because a person you could maybe escape. Right. It's a house. Yeah. And, you know, like, that's the heart of every haunted house uh, book, movie, whatever there is. Yeah. But I love the way that she just does it with language that just, that not saying. And yeah. even, like, as a little kid, like, 12 or whatever, when I read it, I just thought, I love that idea of doing it that way. Uh-huh. And I would definitely say, um, you know, one of my favorite short stories from you is, I don't know the name of the bat, but it's in uh, Slapbox Jesus. I told you the one about... The, the boy who, like, keeps all the, like, yeah. human waste. And the, what's the name of that? Ghost story. Ghost stories, yeah. I love that story because, to me, I feel like what horror got to as a um, genre, what, your, what, what that story got to was more about these feelings of loneliness. Yes. This pervasive sense, this deep sense of loneliness and how sometimes we hold on to the shit in our lives to, like, exacerbate that feeling. Mm-hmm. But that's also an act of agency. That's but right. that's also an act of sometimes... Trying to be, you know, collecting these things that keep us alone is how we find our community in a weird sense. That was his community was a shit. That's that right. He kept from people. That's right. Um, and so when you started writing, was horror the first thing you started to write, or were you try- just trying to see how your voice sounded on the page? No, I was explicitly. I was trying to copy Stephen King, mm-hmm. uh, in particular, and Clive Barker. But uh, I was uh, writing, so like I would take a, st- say there's a book of Stephen King stories, Skeleton Crew or something mm-hmm. like that. And I would pick one of the stories from there, 
and most of his stories take place in Maine, ruralish kind of life, mm-hmm. white working class life or whatever. And I would just take whatever the basic story was mm-hmm. and just move it to New York mm-hmm. and to Queens, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, even to the point where it would be, it would be some guy in his 30s who's got a marriage that's failing and all this, but I'm 13. Mm-hmm. I don't know anything about what a marriage, and I'm raised in a household where I never saw a marriage. I don't know what it looks like for a marriage to fail or right, succeed right, right, or anything right, right. like that. But I'm just trying it out, you know. And so I would basically, I guess, these, I mean, these days you would call it plagiarism. If it had been published, it would yeah. have been plagiarism. <laughs> well, good it wasn't published, though, right? It's but, isn't, but isn't that, that's the quote, right? Like, great artists steal. Or yes. great artists borrow. Great artists steal. Great artists steal, but the problem is you have to, if it's a really good theft, they have to, people can't realize you stole, right? Mm. Whereas, in my case, it would take two, like the kind of magazines I also would have been reading and sending it to mm-hmm. would also be reading Stephen King. Oh, and so they would have said, know. like, what is, this yeah, is this obviously is, this that. Is literally, yeah. Right? Um, so, yeah, if you can hide your theft, yeah, you know, then your son can be president. So your first book is what's the first book? That the first came? book is Slapboxer. Yes, yeah, sla- oh, that's yeah. the first book, that's and that came out ninety eight, ninety nine, ninety nine. Yeah. Um, what was uh some of the early reception to that, and how how did you? Because part of writing and part of horror is, I guess, seeing an audience react to the horror. Yes. Was the reaction that you got from that book? Uh, the reaction that you wanted in terms of what you were going for versus what you got? Well, so in that case, i say for the most part, uh, the horrors in there are mostly like realist horror. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The ghost story one is on the outer edges of that kind of stuff. But uh, in a way... It reminded me of Seven, the movie Seven. Oh, I like that. For some reason. Maybe because, again, the saving stuff and the... yeah. And violence. you just never know what people got going on in the apartments. And that's that's, that's right. another horror in New York that's City. Right. Like, New you York don't know, City, like especially. you don't know what going on. That's yeah. right. Um, but um, the the most of the stories in that one are pretty realistic, mm-hmm. and they're mostly about black and Latino boys growing up in Flushing Queens, like yeah. I did, and like my most of my crew was, mm-hmm. or at least a good portion. Um, and so what I the good thing was I got really mostly very positive review except i got this one uh super racist review in the times oh, in the Jesus. new york times i remember i just remember, I, I never will forget the uh because it was so like you maybe you don't like the book that's fine yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. but I, re- I i will never forget the line where he said uh, uh those of us less enamored with literature pumped through a boom box oh, shit. will say no or what something like fuck? that and just really i'm God, telling you damn. the crazy thing about this is like so um who wrote that uh, his name is Ray Sawhill. <laughs> I, I'm We're looking for you, Ray. We're looking for you. He, I, and, but the funny thing is, I knew where he lived because at, uh, at the time, when that came out, the woman I was dating, she worked at the magazine in the same in the the, the same magazine, Newsweek. I think, uh, yeah, Newsweek. Yeah. Where he worked, mm-hmm. right? She knew him. He was an older guy and all that stuff. And uh, for like two minutes, my boy Aki, who's like an MMA guy and all that stuff, he was like, "Let's just meet him out front." And just beat his ass. Just as beat his ass for doing this. Um, and I really thought about it for a little while. Right. But then there was a, another guy who had a book out at the same time who got a bad review. And then he took out an ad in like a, some magazine where he just talked terrible about the reviewer. And I saw what happened. Like um, the, the larger body of this literary world the only way I can think to say it is they're not used to having to um, stand up for the things they say. Uh. Right? And so there's a way that they take it as sacred. I should be able to say anything I want and there shouldn't be any repercussions. Right? It's just free flow of ideas. This is my reaction to things. You can't uh. beat me up or talk bad about me in an ad. And tell that to Richard Fuller. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, but certain kinds of people do get away with it more. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Especially depending on who they target. Yeah. Right? Uh, and in this case, I saw this this dude was a white dude taking out this ad, talking bad about this person, and I saw him essentially get kind of shunned and like the sense like he's not going to publish another book. They're going to make him pay for that, blah blah blah. Uh, and I thought like, well, if me and my boy Aki show up at Newsweek and beat the shit out of this old white guy, <laughs> this is not going to be good. This is, yeah, this and is more importantly, um, that wasn't the life I, I didn't want to start my writing life. That way, and a sugar night. Yes, way. that's right. That's hanging right. people out of windows. So, but 
Uh, but that is to say, that long whine is to say, I still obviously, number one, remember something from 18 years ago. Yeah. And number two, that really was the only bad yeah. thing. Everything else was very positive. I, n- let me ask you something. Why do you think you can remember the bad reviews better than, I'm pretty sure, like the good ones. Why, why is, what is it about you? Or what do you think it is about writers that allows them to? Because I, I feel like every writer I've spoken to, they all remember a bad. Of course, of course. Yeah. Well, I mean, one is like psychology, right? Like you, uh, there's not many people. I don't know many people who honestly can just let things roll off them. I know there's people who yeah. say they do, <laughs> but I haven't met that many who actually do. Like yeah. you know, behind closed doors, I know I can tell you multiple writers who tell me I don't read reviews in, in interviews. They say I yeah, don't yeah, read yeah, reviews, yeah. and then if I see them at a party or on the phone, they're like, "This motherfucker!" motherfucker. <laughs> they read them, do you know, yeah, yeah, and they yeah, remember yeah. them. But I would just say for myself, it's just uh, it's vanity and insecurity. I'm always like I'm. On the on the vanity side, I'm always amazed if someone has anything bad to say at all. About but you also things. think of the fact that sometimes, like criticism, like there's a fine line between criticism and hate. I feel like, yes, to me, I, to me personally, like my language for criticism has always been as an act of love. Not saying that you have to like you know hobnob over it. Yeah. But there's a sense of where the criticism is coming from is like I see what you're doing. I'm reading the book on your terms. Yes. I see what you're doing. And this is where I think it succeeds. Right. And this is where I think it could do better and or fail. But right. sometimes, like you said, like, you know, that fucking boombox line. That was just that's like, just what hate. the fuck is that? Yes. Like, that's what the, yeah. And so it's like, I feel like sometimes hate gets concealed as criticism when it's just that's right. hate. I think that's right. And in fact, there I've had critical reviews that actually taught me how to do something better the next time. Like, I saw yeah, 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 yeah. all my reviews. Uh, or as many as come, as come across my desk kind of thing. Uh, and the ones, I, there's like in particular, there's a couple I remember that talked about how I, like, that talked about a, a previous book and the idea like of how, whether or not the narr- uh, enough of the narrative strands came back in in a way that was satisfying. Yeah. Uh, and that stayed with me and made me really think like, okay, you don't have to wrap up everything. Yeah. But some of the big things... You can't just sort of say like, oh, they just, I just took it where I went. Yeah. If you really want to satisfy what they're trying to teach you is you need to make some of this feel like you've closed at least some of these loops. Right. You've answered some questions. Yeah. And that, I mean, for this book in particular, by the time of the changeling, I really felt I've learned from those kind of reviews. Mm -hmm. But those I don't take as hate. That's criticism. Criticism is healthy. Yeah. And I learned from good criticism, like you said. But hate, that's really like probably just about the most hateful one that I... Yeah. And also it was because it was like first book... New York Times review. There's all these ways that you're building it up as like, oh, this is going to be the thing. Like, I get to put on my at that age, you know, put on the front and of my book. How old are you? Twenty seven. Oh yeah, so you uh, you were my age then. Yeah, and okay. so you know, and then just the name, the New York Times book review. It, having learned how much that means yeah, when yeah. they like you and when they love your stuff and mm. stuff and blah blah blah. And so then to, for that to be the thing, nah, to right. just be like. Oh, Somebody got to go. Yeah. But I remember, yeah, I was, the woman who I was dating, we were down in New Orleans at the Café du Monde. I remember literally eating beignets and coffee when I read the review. Like, we got the Sunday paper, sat down there, read the review, and I was just, like, so angry. And then she read the review, and she was angry for me. But we still had, like, four days of vacation. Yeah. And she said, so is the vacation ruined? Like, are we done now? And I just had this, it was good to, I had a moment, I was like, I'm with this beautiful woman. I'm in New Orleans. I'm 27. I published a book. No. Yeah. You finished your beignets that day? Finished the beignets. Okay, I'm about to say. Uh, and, uh, and I don't think no like, reviews uh, were missing out some beignets. Yes. This is delicious. And you can't, and I just said, like, I can't, I can't let this man now ruin four days of my life. Oh, this. yeah. So yeah. I put it away. And then later was when I was we, talking we to my resumed, boy about it. We resumed. We resumed. Um, um, another element, I think, of this show and just these conversations of what I'm trying to do is really try to get people to understand how to read certain writers, um, i.e. like how to read a Victor Laval. Mm. What is some language you could give to like how you write? Like if you are a person who's you've written your work, but how would you explain your work for somebody else to read? Like how can I recognize a Victor Laval piece? Well, so I would say it probably is a mashup of a couple genres. Okay. All together, and that uh, for me that feels very natural as a person. Now, what genre we do? I know it's horror. So there's horror, definitely. Uh-huh. There'll be literary realism. Uh, and like, what would we describe that as? So that that's the part of the book that is just about two people falling in love. Okay. Marrying, trying to make it with raising a kid, 
all of that stuff. Um, in fact, like some for some readers, they really appreciate getting the real stuff, realist world stuff before we jump into the horror, so that they really care. Okay. And then there's other people who just like, I just wanted to get to the horror. Kind of okay. Thing, right. Yeah. But for me, I feel like I need both. Literary. And then some degree of. Uh, the fantasy, the fantastic. Okay. And then I guess the fantasy or the fantastic is called magic realism if you're considered literary. Right? Yeah. Like, uh, if, if, you, if you're going to be taken seriously, you write magic realism. If you're going to be taken less seriously, supposed to, by, by like the literary world, you write fantasy right. or horror. You're not yeah. supposed to name it that. Yeah. Right? But if you say magic realism, there's a long history of the South Americans who did such great things with it and made it Nobel Prize worthy kind of work yeah, yeah, yeah. that nobody can talk bad about magic realism mm -hmm. but they can talk bad about horror right right is the idea and how did you i don't even think this this seems like this is something that's out of your control as a writer but was this a was this a, a pitfall quote unquote that you were trying to avoid the, the horror distinction because like that literary term is like it's like the respectability politics that's of right. the literary world that's right so was this something that you were actively trying to avoid this is something that you happen to have, you yeah like i don't know like is this is like the chicken or egg situation right. with this? Well, for me, I so saw the first two books are much more literary fiction. Uh, even though things are weird and wild, it's still mostly either in the realm of things that can happen or the character is not completely reliable, so there's room for you to say like, oh, that didn't really happen, but it's his mind mm -hmm. playing tricks kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But then by my third book, my third book has weird monsters in it. Has a, It's called Big Machine. It has... Um, homeless people strapping bombs to themselves and blowing themselves up in the Bay Area. It has, I mean, it has a secret societies of like a, uh, essentially like of black people doing like X Files slash X Men kind of investigative work. Okay. Uh, so at that point, I knew I can't pretend anymore, and I don't want to pretend. Like it was also a conscious choice on my part. That was the one I started saying in interviews that I was a horror writer. Um, I was a literary writer trying to become a horror writer, was the way I started talking about it. Mm -hmm. And I started talking about it that way in part because I did want to teach anyone who was talking with me, yeah. especially like on the literary end of interviews mm -hmm. or reviews and stuff, I wanted to teach them, you have to talk to me about this, mm -hmm. with this as an explicit mm -hmm. uh, reference. And so then I would see, like by the time of like my fourth book, a book called Devil and Silver, I started seeing the term coined literary horror oh shit right you, as a you way in the genre that's right because you, 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 you didn't chart a new territory they have to make space for you like, all right fuck with Vic going over there you're gonna have to like clear the way make this chop the trees down and gentrify that area for but <laughs> yes but it's fair like when i started making friends with folks who were considered horror writers who basically and the distinction is just they didn't come through mfa programs mm -hmm. they published with either horror publishers yeah. or with commercial publishers who publish more fantasy and horror, yeah. we would kind of get in these conversations where they would be like, what the hell is literary horror? What, what does that even mean? I said, I don't know what it means. It means that the people who like me didn't want to say that they like horror. So they like <laughs> literary <laughs> horror. And then... Fuck it. And then that's... And I, and, you know, and then I think for them, as long as I didn't think I was sort of putting myself on a different tier, then we could just talk as people who love this stuff. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Because yeah. Then, cause I would read a lot, I, a bunch of them that I would meet, I would read their work, and if it had been published on Knopf, Random House, Little Brown, I promise you it would be literary horror because mm. it's brilliant and smart and exciting and interesting and wrestling with big ideas. But it comes out on a house that has a, like even has the name horror in it if it's a smaller press. Yeah. And suddenly... Nah, it doesn't. It's get not. That. Yeah, it's not that. that's that's a, that's you know, that's an interesting way to, and that's I think that's a real way of like like who gets considered hip hop, who gets considered like fine art, who gets considered right. anything. It's like right. who who's the gatekeeper that allows who you vouches to, for you. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, so, this, it, so it was like you you kind of had the Little Wayne. You were like a Drake of horror, <laughs> and then Little Wayne stamped you, and you're like, oh, you hip hop. <laughs> yes, you, that's you right. Could, that's you could have easily, easily been an indie artist. That's right. But the but you had a Little Wayne cosign. That's dope. <laughs> That's my analogy for this. <laughs> I'll take that analogy. <laughs> um, so I know that uh, the ballot, yeah, the ballot of, of Black Tom, of Black Tom, got option for a show. That's right. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Talk about that. What, is, so, what, what, uh, what does this mean? Well, so what it means is so AMC uh, optioned it and is developing it. The nice thing it means like it's just me in a room with 
uh, these three executives from the I'm channel. loving just how every time you talk about something, there's music. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if the mics will I, pick like this up. It. Yeah, yeah, it's like music, just violins just playing in the background. If you hear that, that's, I think Vic brought them. I brought, brought them, them with they're them. hitting out there. <laughs> but, um, and so what I did when they were first interested in optioning the book, I said, yeah. uh, uh, well, I would like to, I want to make my pitch, I would like to write it. You know, you should, I want you to let me write it. Like, because usually, you know, they might say, uh, I'm not a screenwriter, like, professionally, I haven't mm -hmm. had that life. So, um, uh, they might say... A screenwriter, like, what they call them? A showrunner. A showrunner, yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, but they might even hire, like, a screenwriter who would then later work with a showrunner if they got that far. Okay. Uh, but I said, uh, they said, do you even have any samples? And I did have a sample of something I had written. Oh, dope. So, I said, take a look at this. They read that, and then they said, well, all right, we like this. Enough that we'll give you your shot. And uh, and so and then I said, uh, what I would also love is I want to write it, but I would also like to be the co-executive producer, mm -hmm. so that I would also have some say in yeah. casting and oh, things like that. You know, um, and the, what was great about them was, um, I mean, you know, so they've done like Breaking Bad and Mad Men and all this. Yeah. Uh, they were very clear that they felt like their shows do best when they have a creator who has a real pro point of view. Uh, so the things I was asking for, some other cha channel or whatever would just be like, shut up. Nah, yeah, we you know, we're, 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 we have a machine, we're just feeding this into the machine. Yeah. Whereas uh, the folks at AMC, at least so far, were very much like, well, if you feel that strongly and you have, you've shown us you can do this thing, and we here are maybe not people who have done this kind of shit story or show a million times, mm -hmm. we would love it if you are enthusiastic. Right. And so now, I, so I wrote the pilot, they gave me some notes. I'm revising the pilot now, um, and the hope is that uh, they read the pilot, they like it enough. The way they do it is, if they like the pilot enough, then they then they they don't immediately sh shoot the pilot. They then say, okay, now we want to work on writing out the whole first season. Oh shit! And they go through all the notes and revisions of that, and then once they get a whole first season yeah. good, then they film the whole season. Okay. And in that way, like what they tried to say to me was. Um, it can be disappointing for people sometimes because what they hope is you film the pilot and then on a selfish level as the writer and executive producer you get paid like an extra bound amount of money if they actually film it mm. and then even if they say no you can go to another channel with another show and say look this is what my show would look like uh, right so you get some kind of proof that you can bring yeah, up yeah, yeah. but their whole thing was if we invest in you we want to invest in you for a show not for yeah. one episode so if we get to that point and then we shoot a whole show, then I promise you we will have invested so much in you we want it to succeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that so we're very early in the stages, but um, but so far they've been very yeah positive. Now was that a big check? You ain't got to tell me the number, but was it a? I will you, say you um, take your family out to dinner with that check. I'll tell you this: uh, I paid off all my student loans. Hey, I don't know what your student loans look it like. Was, uh, it was, it was not a small amount. Woo! Yeah. There you go. And Shout was, out to AMC. Was, so tell us. It was a good thing. Um, what Blonde Tom is because I we, we I want to know I want people to, for Black, the Battle of Black Tom. What's the story about? Because if it's paying off student loans, I got to know how to write <laughs> a story like Black Tom. Uh, well, Battle of Black Tom was uh, there was a writer from the 1920s and 30s named H. P. Lovecraft. Okay. He's one of the most the horror. famous horror yeah. writers around now, uh, and he did a kind of horror called cosmic horror. And the idea of cosmic horror was that. Um, the universe doesn't care about human beings at all. And the most horrible thing on earth is that we, we in quotes, we're used to thinking we were the center of the universe. You know, you go back to when we thought the, the, the universe revolved around the earth and yeah. all that kind of stuff. But the real horror at the heart of most of his stories is at a certain point, a person comes to realize how, how minuscule and unimportant human beings are in the larger designs of these great creatures of the world and the universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that drives them mad, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so he wrote some amazing stories that way, but he was also uh, an incredibly racist and sexist and uh, anti-Semitic person, yeah. right? Um, so his stories are full of that. Some of them are full yeah. of that. One in particular is oh, called... Oh, was he German? He was, no, he was uh, a white guy from uh, Rhode Island. His name's from Rhode Island. But he took great pride, he always said, in being of pure English stock. Right, and 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 as as is often the case with people like this, they used to have money, but like uh, due to the people were not very good with money. People sometimes had like addictions or mental illnesses. 
the family lost its money, mm-hmm. and the more money they lost, the more pride they took in their heritage because that's all they had, oh, right? Shit. They're they're that's all psychological. That's psycho- That's right. Yeah, 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 and yeah. so by the time of Lovecraft, they're down to basically just one house in Rhode Island. Mm. It's him, his mother, his father dies in an insane uh, asylum. Uh, people believe because he had um, uh, syphilis, oh, right? Uh, he was a traveling salesman. Somewhere on the road, he got syphilis. Yeah, he was he was selling. He right? was selling. He came back home. <laughs> they put him away, and he just lived with his mother and his. He had his two aunts, and they filled his head with like, "You are raised from like, you are like from the great English." Star. It wouldn't make sense why somebody like that would then create cosmic horror. Exactly. Like you need something to believe. You need something to believe. Yeah, and like, also, you need something that looks like how you feel. Like, yeah, we're yeah, supposed yeah. to be great, but look at us. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, he wrote a story called The Heart. Uh, at one point in his life, he did marry. He was a pretty, like, uh, shut in kind of person. Mm-hmm. Never really worked. But he met this woman named Sonia Green. He was really anti Semitic, but he married her. She was a Jewish woman, right? It'd be uh, like that. Sometimes. Yes, it's just like that. Uh, and so, and she supported him. Mm-hmm. And said, and she was a hat maker mm-hmm. and hat seller. She said, "My job is in New York. You're gonna have to move with me to New York." Mm-hmm. So he moved with her to New York for a very short time, like a year or something like that. They were only married for about three years, and he lived in Red Hook, right? Mm-hmm. And he hated it. He hated immigrants of all kinds. He hated uh, native-born black people too. He hated everybody, Chinese, everybody, to the point where, like, when in Reddit stories about him writing to friends, if he was walking down the street and any group of immigrants came, he would walk in the middle of the road so he wouldn't have to be near them. Like, this is the kind of person he was. Sure, it's such a waste of time. Such a waste of time. But uh, but you have to feel... Like, people with nothing have to feel better than somebody. Right? Yeah. Like, that's what they do. Uh, and so, he writes this one story in particular called The Horror at Red Hook. Okay. And that becomes... It's not... Even people who love Lovecraft admit it's not one of his best stories. Right. But it takes place in Red Hook. And it's all about this secret conspiracy among all the, as he says in the story, swarthy immigrant races of Red Hook are colluding with this one white man, who is, of course, their leader, uh, to do something terrible that will kill uh, blonde Norwegian children and all this. I mean, all his race stuff is in there, right? Yeah. But I started reading him when I was 10. And even that story, I read that story, and I feel like at 10, I didn't pick up on that stuff yeah. exclu- explicitly. So in a way, he got in my bloodstream before I realized how much he hated people. Oh, shit. Right? Um, so I loved him. And then at a certain point, I got old. It's like a, you got old enough at Thanksgiving dinner to realize what your uncle is actually saying oh, shit. about something, about some yeah, 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 and you yeah. start to realize, oh, my uncle has some problems. Yeah, yeah. And so I put him down for a long time. Yeah. And then when I got older and started getting into horror again and all that stuff, I picked him up again. And now it was a mix of like love and hate when I read him. Yeah. And so when I sat down in 2015, the summer of 2015, I was feeling like I wanted to write like a like an argument to him yeah but using one of his stories essentially against him mm-hmm. right and so i picked horror at red hook because i don't know anything about rhode island i couldn't outright him about rhode island but i could outright him about new york mm-hmm. like easy so i took that story and i basically retold that story mm-hmm. but now instead of it being from the point of view of this white detective uh named malone who is like afraid of all these immigrant groups and all this stuff i told it from the point of view of a black man named tommy tester from harlem Mm-hmm. And I made it a story really about life in New York as a black man in Harlem. Okay. And then about um, Ooh, I want to see who Queens who, and all you, that stuff. You, 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 you don't know who, who do you can you speak to who you have in mind playing this person? I mean, I have some dream ideas, but it's too early. Too early. It's way too okay. early. Well, yeah. Well, we got to have you on the show. I think it's closer. <laughs> yes, it gets closer. We gonna, um, before you cut out, we got to get you to read something. Okay. Which, what, what did you bring to read? I brought, uh, I figured I could just read like the first, even like the first two, three paragraphs of The Changeling. Okay, cool. So uh, before we get that, we got this violin music playing in the background. If you can't hear it, you're missing out. If you can't hear it, Vic brought him. That's That was one of his things. But we got to have you have this. The, the gin and juice of the lit world. All right. It's called Marduce. So we're going to have you tap the bottom of the bottle. You know. Boom. Then. Get, 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 get in on this. We got it. For the hood one time. Cool. We get that on camera. So. What the what the Marduce is. Is a mix of the Martinelli's apple juice. Shit. And. Ah. I got my keys. We almost got it. <laughs> almost got it. Not that. Yeah. Now they have to hear the music. Yeah, I mean, this was all planned. Actually, all you know what it reminds me of is that you ever see that movie uh, Requiem for a Dream? That was with Marlon Wayans? Uh, yes. 
Yeah. Toward the end, when everyone's life is falling apart, and yeah. people's life, it sounds like this. <laughs> that music like it sounds like that. All right, so I got it open. So boom, pop that, right. pop that top. You're gonna drink the uh, Martinelli's apple juice past the leaves, right below the leaves. Then, oh no. fill you up. Let's give you a little bit because it's still middle of the day. I was gonna say, is that fill up? Uh, I'm sure I can fill up a little more than that. Okay. All right. <laughs> we, we. Hold on. And I gotta. Now that it's a, uh, I'm fucking up. Marker, because you gotta, because we don't we don't put the Marduce label on it until uh-huh. the, the Duce goes in, because that's false advertisement otherwise. <laughs> so we gotta give you that. This is like Michael Secret stuff, but better. This is like, ah, uh, all right, boom, 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 boom. This is like fully. Oh, that one's totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This so, is, so thank you for being on lip, man. Yeah, man, it's good to be here. Boom. All right. good yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's 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 more that's, that's the gin and juice of the lit world so <laughs> all bring right us in with the first chapter man all right I'm a, why not just read it? the first chapter is a little long but i'll well, yeah, we, we, yeah. read a couple whatever do do yeah just, all right do, do what feels right this fairy tale begins in 1968 during a garbage strike in february new york city's sanitation workers refused to pick up trash for eight straight days 100,000 tons of garbage filled the sidewalks spilled into the streets. Rats ran laps alongside morning joggers. Rubbish fires boiled the air. The five burrows had been given up for dead. Still, there was some cracked magic in the air, because that was when Lillian and Brian met. Each had journeyed from far-flung lands to find one another in Queens. Neither could have guessed the wildness that falling in love would unleash. Mm. That's good. Yeah, I feel like I, I mean that was that felt that does the that thing. felt like it. That <laughs> felt like it. So, um, where can people buy the book, The Changeling? When can where can people buy this book if they're looking for it? It should be it should be in your local bookstore. Okay, number one, and if not that, then every place where you buy books, okay. Barnes and Noble, Amazon, independent uh, bookstores. Independent bookstores is the number one. Number one, uh, place. yes. Um, so get your hand get your hands on a copy. Cool. So and, it should be everywhere. And where can people find you? How can people get, you know, they want to holler at you about the things you talk about, H.P. Lovecraft, otherwise talk <laughs> about horror, chop it up. Where can people find you? Are so you? the website is just my name, VictorLavelle.com. Okay. Dot com. Yeah. And then uh, on Twitter, mm-hmm. at, uh, at Victor Laval. Okay. And that's, that's, and that's, that's it. it. And then any events, any readings coming up? Any? Mm, no, not for a while. Okay. Are you teaching? Uh, yeah, I started again in September at Columbia University in their MFA program. Okay, so if you at the MFA program at Columbia, you could probably catch Vic there too. Teaching. You could, what you, are you teaching at? Uh, so I'm teaching a writing workshop, a novel workshop oh, right. that lasts a year. Okay. Uh, and then I'm teaching for the undergraduates, I'm teaching a class on plot dope. and how to actually come up with one. That's dope. Yeah. Okay. Um, before you get out of here, man, I have to bless you with the lit pen. This is oh. all the guests. That come come through. Ah, that's very kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very that's kind. A, that's beautiful. A, yeah, that's a hundred dollar pin. <laughs> but you know, for being on lit, you get it. For you already <laughs> I paid the price for I being lit. Paid the price. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, before you get out of here, your literary swag. When I first met you, it was at uh, Jess Rouse uh, event at Greenlight mm-hmm. when you had interviewed him for your face and mine. Yes. Has your literary swag changed since then? Your three writers and your three clothing designs. Has that changed? Uh, well, as far as clothing designs, definitely the Onitsuka Tigers remain. Okay. Um, and now, actually, I, I like uh, Albert and Fitch for their socks. Okay. The sock game. Your sock, your sock game is... Okay, I would say that's one thing. Amazing. Victor Laval's sock game is about to be fleeky. <laughs> Swaggy. All and, of then, the uh, and then the last thing is not a piece of clothing, but an but a accessory. My Gershon canvas bag okay is uh, great it looks like it can carry a lot it can carry a lot and it's very lightweight and it's beautiful and then the writers and then the writers uh it's let me think shirley jackson is mm-hmm. still there stephen king is still there mm-hmm. and uh let's say and gail jones okay yes well this has been another episode of lit um, you're don israel i'm messing up i'm messing up this marduce got me tripping you're don israel Victor Laval, 
the violins have been playing, the flies have been flying. Follow us at Lit Platform. Shout out to Pink Pig Productions. Shout out to Surreal Jewels. We out. It's lit. We gonna holler.